Well, let's talk about uh, your, your guys' movie, Uncle Tom 2. Yeah. What's uh, what's it about? What's going on? I saw the first one, and uh, I learned a lot about Herman Cain, and he was, uh, he was a badass. That was awesome. Yeah. So, you know, Uncle Tom 1, we'll call it Uncle Tom 1, was uh, really turned out to be a, kind of a conservatism 101. You know, I start I started the film just out of, of a curiosity of you know why Black America, when it came to conservative Black America, uh, was treated in such a way. And I think around 2015, 2016, uh, during that cultural climate, um, the hypocrisy was very real for me. Um, in 2012, Herman Cain, um, you know, was running for president. And, you know, I supported Herman Cain. I thought he was great. And two years prior to that, you know, or I'm sorry, a couple of years prior to that, you know, if you didn't support Barack Obama, you were a racist. And so literally like, you know, one political cycle later, a black man from the South, from Atlanta, Georgia, runs for president. And he was, you know, a coon and Uncle Tom, all the things, the media completely destroyed him. And that shocked me because at the time I'd never seen the media talk about a black man that way because by that time we were already on eggshells. So that kind of started the, 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 the wanting to make the film. And then as I started interviewing black conservatives, it kind of just opened up this entire world to me. And I realized there was a lot of diversity. There was a lot of different uh, walks of life within the black conservative movement. And on that journey, I met Chad Jackson, who was one of the, the people I interviewed for the film. And he actually became the main subject of, of the first film. And during that time, um, you know, we became pretty close friends. And when the film released and it was, you know, we had some success and it was very well received and uh, we were riding the wave of that. Um, I realized that there was more work to be done. There was, a, there was more story to tell. And so I asked Chad to come on board with me. And um, so, what, uh, give us a synopsis on the first one, and then tell us about the first. Them. The first one I would say was Conservatism 101. We called it an oral history of the American Black Conservative. It was basically just establishing the fact that not all Black people are far left Democrats. That not all Black people hate America. That not all Black people view themselves as victims in America. And I kind of I think that uh, I would imagine. The, the the stereotype I guess of the black community in the church is that they're more conservative outright but for some reason keep voting with Democrats they are and I think part two as we you know part two gets more into the historical lineage of what happened to black America and during during the process you know it, we take it all the way back to Marx you know uh, when our country was on fire a couple of years ago during the the BLM chaos there was an interview that Patrice Cullors, you know, slipped up and told the world that she was a trained Marxist. And so people started like, well, what does that mean? And what is this worldview that's got my country on fire? So Uncle Tom too goes to Karl Marx, explains who he was, explains what he believed and his ideology and how it made its way into America and, and how America had to be, um, transformed slowly gradually because of our history because of our individual spirit marxism didn't really work in america it worked in the east it spread like fire in the east but in the west it, marx marxism was harder to sell well it's been gaining a foothold across the board in a variety of fashions it, and, it, and for america it's taken a little over 100 years to to get where we are and as we zoom into marxism you find that black America was the low hanging fruit for that ideology to take hold and to use black America as its tool for destruction in our country. Yeah. I like, so from our perspective and, and Justin's 100% uh, right. Uh, for me, what uncle Tom two does is it showcases this era of black prosperity that we're not, we're not, traditionally told about in the mainstream media. And when I say mainstream media, I'm talking about uh, organizations like NPR, which is constantly putting out, you know, stories of black America as they see it. And it it's constantly depicting black America as being oppressed, as being under the thumb of the white man, as being um, hated by this country. 
But what we found when we dug in, th- you know, to the archives is that Black America was thriving in the 1900s, from the early 19 to the mid 1900s, uh, not uh, in spite of the white South, but in some cases with the help of the white South. And so what we found is that race relations between white and black in the South were actually far more harmonious than uh, kind of oppressive, like we're constantly told about. And so we're able to show these these beautiful uh, uh, photos and, and just this footage of things that are not just frankly talked about in the mainstream media and to the extent that they do talk about it, um, it's always kind of uh, 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 tainted with this kind of, of, of oppressive message that is meant to uh, constantly remind black people that you are oppressed, this country hates you, and because this country hates you, you need to vote this way, you need to think this way, you need to, uh, in a sense, be entitled. And so it, it's offering a different perspective, if you will. The film also shows how, to the extent that you have these so-called black organizations, like the NAACP, like Black Lives Matter, like these organizations that are all about blackness, asserting blackness, when you lift up the veil, when you pull back the curtain, what you find behind these so-called black organizations are white Marxists. Yep. And so it's important to showcase that because this whole, like, you know, this whole pejorative of Uncle Tom it's meant to silence individuals like Herman Cain, like Larry Elder, like Thomas Sowell. Because if you listen to Thomas Sowell, if you listen to Larry Elder, if you listen to Alan West, you'll find that these guys actually know what the heck they're talking about. And to the extent that people apply what it is they're saying, they will be benefited not only as black folks, but as people in general. And so you don't want such a man to have a kind of effect on the masses of people, let alone black people. And so you want to, in a sense, demonize them and ostracize them and make them look as a kind of parasite amongst the masses of black people. So you're going to call them this pejorative, you know, Uncle Tom, Coon, Bootlicker, Sellout, so on and so forth, because you want to silence them. So we, we demonstrate that to the extent that these so-called black liberal activists are using these pejoratives, they themselves are having their puppet strings pulled by who? white Marxists. And so at the end of the day, I don't care whether ideology is coming from a white person or a black person. I don't care because race isn't that important to me. But to the extent that I can expose that the people behind these so-called black, you know, pro-black individuals are actually white Marxists, once we can get that out of the way, then we can have a conversation about what actually matters and what actually matters is ideology. And what kind of manifestations does ideology have on the way in which people are actually living and whether or not people are prospering or whether they're constantly failing? Baltimore is an example of how we're failing under Marxism. Detroit is an example of how we're actually failing under Marxism. South side of Chicago, all of these organizations are, 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 I'm sorry, cities are examples of how we're failing under our Marxism. We went your way. We applied your policies. We applied what it is you're pushing, what it is you're selling. And black people are not being benefited by it. And so these, maybe, uh, yeah, these, these uh, woke leftists, they're the same kind of people that were pro-slavery. They're the same kind of people that just want the status quo, and they and they're hiding behind the revolutionary ideas. But but it's not the case. Yeah, there was a there's a story I like to cite where a teacher asked his students, "How many of you would have opposed slavery in the time of the American Civil War?" And all the kids raised their hand. He's like, "Oh, okay. So tell me something that you'll publicly admit to supporting that's a deeply unpopular and you know incites anger and hatred." And they don't have anything to say. The point was that most of these kids were just doing whatever they thought would get them to fit in. And when you look at, you know, I remember reading about Frederick Douglass and he challenged Americans to to, to live by the standard of their own constitution, the words that they wrote and swear and and swear allegiance to. Will they uphold that all men are created equal, that these rights exist for everybody? And then a bunch of people got pissed off at him, a bunch of white racists. Those are the people who are like, don't you screw with what I got. The left thinks that they're revolutionaries, but they're supporting the corporations, they're supporting the FBI, they're supporting the government and its policies and its machine, and they're demonizing. I'll give you an example. Antifa is the perfect example of this. This is, this is who I think of. Overwhelmingly white. They know it. They love wearing masks because they don't want anyone to realize it. And I watched white Antifa scream at a black ICE officer, the N-word, and I've personally witnessed 
white Antifa screaming the N-word at a black proud boy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, those, all of those Antifa, they're all white, every single one of them. And then over here on the Proud Boy side is like Mexican guy and there's like a Filipino guy and there's a couple black guys and there's a bunch of white guys. And I'm like, isn't that so strange? That's the case. There are people who believe in individual liberties and there are people who believe in just do as the mob says or else. Yeah. Yeah, you're 100% right. And like that's like we depict that in our film. We talk about people like Saul Alinsky. We talk about who the real kind of founder of Black Lives Matter is. It is a white Marxist. Like people look at these, you know, three black women and think like, oh, um, you know, they started this organization because of Trayvon Martin and because of their being fed up with the police brutality that the police are constantly uh, kind of dashing out against, you know, black, uh, you know, uh, black and, you know, individuals who can't protect themselves when in reality, like, no, that's not the case at all. Um, it is a white man who uh, who subscribes to Marxist ideology, who is training these people by his own admission. He says that I go after uh, women, black and Latino women. I train them to be revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. I train them to start organizations. Like we depict that in this film. And so one of the things that we set out to do in making Uncle Tom 2 is we didn't want to, in a sense, regurgitate the same old conservative talking points. We wanted to go deeper. We wanted to show people where this ideology is based out of. And so this film, in my in my opinion, is, is superior to Uncle Tom too, is in that in the sense that we take people deeper to see like where all of this comes from so as to not be constantly intimidated by whatever social justice movement comes along in a given era. So so you're trying to tell me when uh, Joe Biden said you're not black if you don't vote for him that he was wrong? <laughs> well, I think one of the things I'm most proud about about part two and, and the work that we've done is just really like getting to the core of America. Like mm -hmm. what made America, uh, what made America was our, our, our worldview, you know, our, our Christian ethic and, you know, being a moral people, you know, and if you look at the history of Marxism in this country, the number one goal was to demoralize us as a people and if you just take black america just as a microcosm of america if you look at the footage that we show you in this film black america was a very prosperous very entrepreneurial spirit uh, very moral people very church going very nuclear family like all those things were were happening for black america in the early 1900s and when you what what the Marxists were able to do was slowly demoralize black America and now we're seeing the effect of America at large is just to take our um, our morals away from us and create chaos you know and with with the Christian worldview that America was built on you had order you know there was a foundation there was a foundation in God and and that created a a set of rules a set of a set of, of a, a way to do things a way to do life and that has been the, 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 the goal and the tactic to destroy our country is to slowly chip away at those morals and those values. And so I think, in my opinion, what we've, what we've put together in Uncle Tom 2 um, really showcase that, showcases how this happened like no other film. And I think that you know, what we're getting from people that are watching it and writing us is that it really equips them, it arms them with the knowledge that they really couldn't articulate themselves. Yeah. It gives them the ability to um, understand what they what they knew but they couldn't articulate. Yeah. And I think that we've labored over this film for the past two years to, you know, because explaining Marxism is hard to do. Yeah. It's very hard to do, to, to explain these ideas. You know, the first film was much easier to put together because conservatism is pretty easy to explain. But Marxism is rooted in deception, so it's hard to untangle that for people. Right on. And I feel people are 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 expressing expressing that Uncle Tom too is giving them that uh, confidence to talk about these issues. Yeah, in a nutshell, like the way that I would explain it is like what Marxists understood, Tim, is that um, to the extent that they wanted to inject their ideology into the American society. They were having a very hard time doing it because the culture that existed in America was very antithetical to the communist worldview. And so um, the fact of the matter is that culture 
like how does cultures persist cultures persist generationally through children uh you instill and then you know and impart your culture to your children and then they carry it on into the future and so what the marxists resolve to do is that if we can get into the to the uh to the culture of the children if we can in a sense uh cause them to rebel against the adult generation um to reject the culture of the adult generation we can um, in a sense, inject, inject our culture and our society in, in our worldview into the youth to where, you know, the trajectory of our country is completely different. And so when you look at second wave feminism in the 60s, when you look at the hippie movement in the 60s, when you look at the free love movement in the 60s, when you look at the civil rights movement, when you look at the black militant movement, all of these are rebellious to the adult generation of the 60s. And what they were able to do was to demoralize a culture to where they are rejecting the adult generation and are adopting this kind of new worldview to the extent to where today more young people under the age of 30 are embracing socialism than any other youth generation before in this country. That goes to that goes to show that what Yuri Bezmenov talks about who was a defectant uh, who who defected from the KGB it goes to show that what he talked about actually played out the way that he described it and so yes th this is something that has taken place in our country uncle tom too uh describes it uh in a very palatable way in a in a sense in a way that no other film um and that i've seen have been able to to, to break it down. Thanks for checking out this segment from the Timcast IRL podcast. But if you want to check out the full show live, tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And if you want more special access content, head over to Timcast.com and become a member. Your membership helps sustain this company, keep our journalists employed, makes this show happen, and you will get access to exclusive members-only segments of the Timcast IRL podcast. And there's a massive library to check out. So again, go to TimCast.com or tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And we'll see you all there.